Well, congratulations, everyone, for being here. 9 a.m., first Monday after New Year. I'm impressed. So uh, welcome. Welcome back to PI, if you've been away for the break. So my name's Ruth Gregory, and I'm going to be doing the gravitational physics review course. So I just want to uh, point out, of course, this is a great year in which to be teaching GR, or being aspects of GR, because it's 2015. It's 100 years since Einstein put out his theory of general relativity. And it's the International Year of Light, I think it's called. So what precisely that means, I'm not sure. But nonetheless, any excuse for a celebration. So uh, So you've had a good introduction to general relativity from Neil, and I think I saw that David had once again come in and done his usual sort of uh, blitz on aspects of uh, manifolds and differential geometry. So some of what we'll be doing will be familiar um, at first, but uh, also obviously we'll be going into more depth and going back to some of the things you've seen, but maybe doing them a little differently and doing some new stuff. But I'd better set out my stall first. <clears throat> so for the metric, I think I'm, I use the opposite signature, probably. Um, and that is... Uh, dt squared is positive, so our world lines, the tangent vectors, have positive norm. Uh, the other points, obvious places at which you can have uh, a choice of convention, so I have to sort of say this just so it's clear, is the definition of the Riemann tensor. So again, I think this is pretty much normal or standard, but it is the derivative of the Christoffel comes in on this third index here. So that's conventions there. The Ricci tensor contracts on the first and third index, not the first and fourth. And as is common, I set h bar and c to be 1, so that's normal for field theory, but not what may be slightly different to some, some courses or some gravity notes you might see, as I'm not going to set Newton's constant to 1 or even 8 pi g to 1, because I like to keep dimensions. So it's, used, it's nice to have some dimensions to keep track of, and also because we're going to <laughs> in time play around with the dimensionality of space-time, one thing you'll see is that Newton's constant is a derived quantity, so it's kind of useful to see how that comes in as the dimensions change. The dimensions of G change with the dimensionality of space-time. So my Einstein equations, therefore... <clears throat> Are the following. I've got a G in them, and they're with that sign. And so that sort of sums up the, the rules of the game, what we'll be using. So the aims of what we're going to do over the next three weeks. Now, as you know, because I'm standing here at 9 rather than 10.15, we've got two lectures today, two lectures tomorrow then the standard model people get here. So 9 a.m. will be standard model slot from Wednesday onwards. But then they're taking my slots on Thursday and Friday of next week. So it's all a bit kind of shifted, but it means you're going to get a, a real dose of GR to kickstart the year, so that's it's quite suitable. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back, we're going to redo a lot of the geometry you've already seen, perhaps even with the same formalism that you've already seen, but uh, we'll be giving it uh, perhaps a little bit more, or a slightly more 
formal setting, more mathematical. So, so we'll also be looking at uh, interactions between gravity and field theory. So, at this sort of simplest sense, we'll be kind of looking at where your energy momentum comes, energy momentum tensor comes from some field theories, but we'll also then be generalizing this, looking at uh, gravitating solutions, which are also interesting from a field theoretic perspective. We'll also look, I'm not sure uh, how much was mentioned about um, thermodynamics, but we'll look at black holes again, because I think they're well worth a second look. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, thermodynamics. And we'll also be looking at higher dimensions. And also some uh, geometry of higher dimensions although this might also be done in mathematical background. And then finally, as always, I usually like to do something which is sort of, like, well, I say frontiers, but it's sort of perhaps talking about a, sort of a recent piece of work or, or just something which is kind of what, what gravity research is about at the moment, or at least personal perspective of that. So, but of course, we have to start at the beginning, and so for today, I'm going to be looking at mathematical backgrounds. So I'm going to be doing uh, differential geometry. As I say, you've probably seen a fair bit of this already, but never hurts to see things again. I don't know, this chalk and me always... Right, so we need to go back and look at differential geometry and put it, we're going to sort of put it in a more formal or mathematical setting because, of course, the key thing about Einstein gravity is that it's not really a theory about forces. It was sort of very different theory from the classical mechanics, even though it is a classical theory, it's not quantum. It was very different from the types of theories that preceded it. So Newtonian gravity was action at a distance, an instantaneous force. Part of the, the planets moved around the sun because they were in a freely falling motion, but it was because the force was balanced. Whereas with general relativity, we kind of replace that with local motion, and the planets are freely falling because they're actually going in straight lines, it's the space that's curved. So it kind of turns it on its head. It's, uh, there, isn't, there is no force, you know? um, but it's, it's saying instead, each uh, massive object or anything with energy momentum will affect the space around it. So that's this to that. And in, in return, the implications of this side, the geometry, tell you that things start to move differently. So that's, uh, that's what we're off to. So let me begin <clears throat> with a definition that I'm certain you've seen. We need to be able to describe a curved space-time. And this is done um, by using something called a manifold. So one thing I'm just going to put in parallel here, so sort of picture for intuition Is, is really the two-sphere, or Earth. So we live on a curved surface, um, but that didn't stop Euclid from developing standard geometry. So it's not that curved spaces are inherently bad things. It's just we have to figure out a way 
of you know use or of sort of explaining curvature within this notion of things being locally Euclidean or flat. So this is what, if I wrote it down in the context of the physics of GR, this is what we would say. A manifold is a set of events because that's how, you know, what constitutes the world around us. It's things that happen. Um, and it's got to look locally flat. So that's really what it's saying physically. But in terms of... Ah, got to relearn my... <coughs> these blackboards. <coughs> but mathematically... How do, we, how do we encode that? Well, we want to say that we've got some set, so we kind of focus in on that, that word, um, and we also locally an Rn. So these are the sort of things that we pick out as being the mathematical uh, aspects. So if I sketch this, this is our manifold or space-time. <coughs> This is our n. And then what we're going to do, and I'll sketch it first and then write it down. We're going to say that locally in the manifold, we've got some little region, which we're going to call a chart, which maps well, there is a map over into Rn. So we could label this map either as uh, just a map xi, or we could say that, you know, it, because in Rn we label the points by x, y, z, etc., etc., we could just say it's x mu. So we have two of these, and these would be x mu primed. So this might be u1 and u2. Sorry, I realised that wasn't good, good English. Okay, so that's just writing down what I just sketched and said while I was sketching. So a manifold is a set, some topological space, such that we can cover the manifold by some collection, which may be infinite, of open sets, U, so I'm labeling them UI, um, and each of these open sets comes along with this map that takes it into a subset of R to the N, and from this we get our coordinates. So, so <clears throat> mostly, I guess, I'll be thinking of the X mu as being the map. It's just a way of labeling locally our, uh, our manifold points. So we see this, the reason even the, the, the words were used, we see this with our example of the Earth. We've got, we know the Earth is, is some two-dimensional surface. We've got an atlas, the times atlas of the world or whatever the equivalent is. 
which in our case with the Earth is finite. Actually, we can get it down to two charts if we want, but it's not always that useful. So, and each of these charts, each of these pages in the atlas, is just some flat sheet, a little subset of R squared, and each of these sort of corresponds to this uh, coordinates X and Y. So normally, actually, we use longitude and latitude with the Earth, but that's not the only chart we could use. So that's, that's our direct uh, intuition corresponding to the mathematics. So you can kind of see where, you know, Riemann, etc., where these guys were coming from. They were sort of thinking, well, we know how it works for the Earth. Let's sort of try and abstract that. So that's really all we're doing here. So in, in GR, of course, we want to do physics. Physics is usually about solving differential equations, so we better deal with that up front. <clears throat> so what we are going to do is we are going to consider infinitely differentiable manifolds. So what do I mean by that? So an infinitely differentiable manifold just means that all these functions, these local uh, coordinates on each chart, are infinitely differentiable. And uh, the, on the overlap, the coordinate transformation on the overlap, so you can see that when I sketched u1 and u2 up there, I deliberately caused them to overlap. That means on that intersection, you could label the points either with x mu or x mu primed, and so in once we're down at Rn, x mu of x mu primed or vice versa is just some map between these different functions, and that's got to be infinitely differentiable. So that's our basic thing. Now we want to start to transport structure up from Rn. So we'll start with the simplest possible thing that we can have, and that is a function. So once again, we use this C infinity. It just means infinitely differentiable. So a function, it's just a number really at every point. So a function is a map from the manifolds into the reals. And we say that it's infinitely differentiable really by saying that in each chart it's infinitely differentiable. So our f, we could say f of x mu. then that's got to be infinitely differentiable in some particular chart. So we've got a sort of the, our set of all functions, I should I've And we just write that C infinity of M. So that's just really a saying that, you know, all the functions, <clears throat> infinitely differentiable functions on a manifold. So that's a bit boring at the moment, so let's, uh, let's try and do a bit more.
So now let's think about going the other way. How, how do we go the other way? Um, so the... I think the easiest way of writing it is to actually sketch it. We've got the real line, so that's one-dimensional. So we obviously can't necessarily... It's not, not a good idea to try and wrap that over the whole of a higher-dimensional manifold. <coughs> so here's our manifold. But we can always take some sort of finite part of it. So here might be a... B, and this is our curve gamma. So this is our map. We're saying that we can go from the reals, and it's like if you sort of imagine turning the real line into some sort of piece of string and putting the piece of string somewhere in the manifold. So this is our curve. It's just a one-dimensional line snaking its way through this curved space-time. So we want to say that it's infinitely differentiable. So once again... We're going to look at some chart, U, which comes with an image in R to the N, and then gamma, as we do the map over into R to the N, obviously has some image over here, which we could write as X mu of T. So we get a direct map from the reals into Rn, that's something we do know how to do, by taking gamma the curve and then projecting over using the local chart. So we say in this case that psi composed with gamma of t is our x mu of t. <clears throat> so that's what's got to be infinitely differentiable. So this infinitely differentiable phrase keeps cropping up time and again and really what you mean is that whatever's going on in the manifold, once you take its image down in R to the N, that's where you're saying it's infinitely differentiable. So some examples. <clears throat> Probably already met. An example of X mu of T is the world line of the observer. I've even <coughs> used notation, T sort of suggestive of time, and x mu, which is suggestive of our four-dimensional location. So our x mu of t might be, we choose t to label our local time, and then x is our position, which is, in general, time-dependent. So <coughs> another example... where we just choose a flat manifold R squared, we can take a map where um, this is gamma. And gamma is just uh, A cos theta, A sine theta. Where, sorry, T. I've been using T from there. Those are just straightforward examples. It's very, very intuitive, the notion of what a curve is. It's a line in your manifold, and you just associate it with a parameterization. So now we're going <clears> to <throat> keep going with this. We're going to use these curves to define vectors. So vector is really a linear operator, and geometrically we think of it as being the tangent to the curve. So uh, I guess it depends how you very first met vectors. Um, sometimes you meet them as being sort of an ordered triplet, uh, but quite often you meet them as being like an arrow, something with a magnitude and a direction, because that is what uh, intuitively vectors are. You know, they usually correspond to a force or to motion. 
So there's something with magnitude and direction. And so this notion of a tangent to a line is really sort of um, encapsulating that geometric intuition. So here's our curve, gamma, in the manifold. We pick a point P on it. <clears throat> and then this is our vector T, our tangent vector to the curve. So T is actually a map from C infinity of M <coughs> into C infinity of M. And it's such that F maps to DF by DT at P. So once again, you're using this notion that here, here's your parameter T. And here's your manifold. You've got a function f in C infinity of m. So you've got a function in the manifold. In particular, it's defined on the curve gamma. So that gives you a function f of t. And we know how to do df by dt. That's just straightforward real calculus. So Okay, so that was a lot of writing. <clears throat> so the first bit's what I just said. We can construct, if f is on a, in C infinity of m, it means that we can construct an f of t using a curve gamma. That's now just a real function. And so our tangent vector is just saying it's the rate of change of the function with respect to t, whatever the function is. And so because that's true for any function, um, and if, in a, if we're in a local chart with coordinates x mu, we can write our dfdt um, in terms of partial derivatives with respect to the local coordinates. So that's just a sort of fairly straightforward application of standard <coughs> calculus. So just the things to note, which you're probably aware of, is of course that t is uh, defined at p. So it's the tangent vector at a particular point. Um, and we can construct, we can build up using different curves and also moving along the curves at different rates. We can actually show that we can build a vector space of such operators, T, at P, which is the same dimensionality of the manifold, and we call it the tangent space. So let's just... Uh, Get that written down. I'm just going to sort of highlight roughly what I mean by that. Here are two different curves, gamma 1, gamma 2, at P, which I'm going to call, sort of label the origin in a way. <clears throat> and then I'm going to sort of construct, here's T1, here's T2. I'm going to say that gamma 3 is gamma 1 plus gamma 2. Now, I put that in inverted commas because I can't necessarily just add those things directly. What I mean is 
I look in some local neighborhood of P, I go down to Rn in Rn, I can add up these two points, and that's how I construct my gamma 3. And so my local chart, if you like, x3 mu would then be x1 mu of t plus x2 mu of t in a local chart. That's how I would define that, and then I would sort of transport that back up. And so I get that t3 is t1 plus t2. So that's kind of how I add up my, uh, my vectors. So that's how I, how I can see. I mean, we won't ever do this again, but this is technically how you would do it, yes? So are those, uh, the x3 equal to x1 plus x2, what so that's defining my gamma 3 as gamma 1 plus gamma 2. So oh. the x3 I'm not, is oh, saying that it's x3 of t. So I'm saying that along gamma 1, I've got uh, x1 mu of t. Along gamma 2, it's x2 mu of t. My gamma 3 here is x3 mu of t. So it's, that's what it means. What I said that I put my inverted commas around gamma 3 was gamma 1 plus gamma 2 because I haven't really defined what does it mean adding these things up, right? Um, but I can add points in R to the N. Now, of course, implicit in this is P is the origin. Otherwise, it's a bit silly, right? Because P better be invariant um, under the process. So we could say T equals 0 is the origin of R to the N is P. So, you know, this is a, I'm not putting absolutely everything down. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, just a minor point. Uh, mm -hmm. You have to go back a bit. When you parameterize the set, you use a close interval. Um, I did in this case, but of course I could, in, we know for the circle, we could map the whole real line again and again and again. In this case, I just illustrated one particular circuit around the circle. It's um, the curve. We don't necessarily need an infinite curve in our manifold. All we need is that locally we've got a one-dimensional thing. I was asking mm -hmm. because I wanted to be sure that you don't have a problem with two points on your parameterization identifying the same point on the manifold. Right, so no, not in this case because... Um, so... Sketch, sketch, sketch. Because all we're interested in is, I mean, if you think about our own world lines, right, we could imagine that, uh, you know, doing something quite complicated like this, okay? Um, so we don't mind if, we, if, if a curve comes back to the same point. Sorry, it wouldn't if it was a world line, would it? But we don't mind if, if curves can come back to each point. Um, what's, what's really just important is that locally we're living along some segment of a line in our manifold. Yep. But surely that those aren't causal, right? Sorry? Surely those aren't causal. No, that's what I said. Of course it's not a world. I, I said a world there and then I corrected myself because, well, at least unless you're Doctor Who, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> Was that what you were going to yeah. Yeah. No, I realized I'd got it wrong. <laughs> okay, so this, where are we? Defines <coughs> the tangent space at P. So we call this TP of M and when we take the set of all tangent spaces for all points, a bit more to it than this, but basically that's what it is. It's the tangent bundle T of M. So just to come back again to our a uh, sample manifold for S2. Let's take P to be one of the poles. 
then we could take a curve, let's say from Waterloo to the North Pole, and a curve from Durham to the North Pole, where I'm from, and we would have two, so that's T Waterloo, T Durham, and at the North Pole that would give us two different uh, vectors, each of which are sort of tangent at the North Pole, and they span a nice flat two-dimensional space. So the tangent plane of the sphere, this is again a very geometric, very intuitive notion. It's like taking a flat plane uh, and some, some, some ball and just simply sort of letting the piece of paper rest tangent to the sphere. And so the tangent bundle is just the set of all these planes around the sphere. So when I wrote down there t being t mu d by dx mu, what I was actually doing was writing down my vector in terms of a basis. So d by dx mu are operators in a local coordinate chart. So each, each of the directions in Rn, x, y, z, and so on, corresponds to a particular, we, can, we could sort of take the pre-image of the x-axis up back to the manifold, which would be some curve gamma, or the pre-image of the y-axis up into the manifold, and each of these would be different curves. And so that's sort of giving us different sort of fiducial um, operators, uh, which, which sort of constitute a basis for our tangent space. So we call this the coordinate basis. This is pretty much the most commonly used basis that we, when we're doing in practice, tensor algebra and GR. And it's simply saying that the pre-images of the axes, those are the directions that we're using to span our vector space. But <clears throat> if we have a metric, we can also <clears throat> use an orthonormal basis. And I could, of course, write any one basis in terms of any other basis. And so with the metric, which, of course, at the moment, I haven't really said how I'm going to build one, but you know what one of those is. So the property of this orthonormal basis is that if you take... Uh, the dot product, in other words, you take the composition of two of the basis vectors using whatever your local metric is, you either get one minus one or zero. It, and you only get one or minus one if the two vectors are the same. So these, this orthonormal basis is something that's going to be quite important when we come back to look at um, connections again. But for the moment, it's, we're sort of looking ahead a little bit. Uh, the other thing that... just want to uh, draw your attention to. It's one of these conceptual <coughs> things that's kind of stating the obvious. Um, and, you know, sometimes it takes... I mean, maybe you'll just grab onto it and get it first time, but sometimes it takes... It's sort of not clear what it's about. And this is just something which was dubbed by Roger Penrose as abstract index notation. And the reason was, it it's kind of sums up the different way that we do um, vectors and tensors when we're doing physics with them, such as gravity or GR, um, or mathematics with them. So we 
well, I say that we, as physicists, we look at this and what this means to us. This really is the energy momentum. This is sort of a geometric object. And this really is a sort of co a composite of the Ricci curvature of the manifold. It's a geometric thing. Whereas mathematicians would say, no, 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 no. These are the components of T. They're just a set of numbers. And it really, I need to know what basis I've got before I can properly interpret TAB. OK? So that's kind of the different, different spin on what you mean. So um, the reason I'm highlighting this is because when I'm going to be covering some of the mathematical aspects, in particular when we get on to connections and the Cartan formalism, I will be using more of the mathematical uh, notation. And so things like TAB really will mean sets of components. Um, but once we've moved beyond our foundations, our mathematical foundations, we'll probably slip back into a more familiar physicist's um, abstract, what's called the abstract index notation, because we need to do calculations. We actually need to get our hands dirty. We're not interested, well, we, we, do, we are interested in the beauty of the theory, but we want to use it, okay? So, <coughs> so when we see T mu, we often think, oh, that's the vector T. So, for example, we might write grad, our covariant derivative of T, is the partial derivative of T plus Christoffel's, right? That is an example of a formula in abstract index notation. We are saying T is a geometric thing, so when we take its derivative, we have to take its partial derivative, and we also have to put in the connection. Okay. In, as we will see, though, when we do the connection more mathematically, if, if we wrote dt, we would, it really would be the partial derivative because the t would be scalars, and the connection would come because the geometric object t would have basis vectors in it. So if we look up there as t is t mu d by dx mu, we would get a piece which was dt, which is just the partial derivatives, and a piece which was the derivative of the basis vectors d by dx mu. So we do need to be careful, and I will try to be careful, but if you are in doubt when it comes to, comes to the crunch, please just pop your hand up and say, just ask for clarification. Because it can sometimes look really weird when you're taking a derivative of T mu and you don't see the gamma there, okay? So just make sure that I haven't sort of gone onto some jet lagged little zombie state and missed it off, okay? So do ask. <coughs> right. Question. Mm -hmm. um, another, another thing about the notation, mm -hmm. can you make a distinction between Greek and uh, Latin indices? Um, I am, I, I'm making a passive distinction between <coughs> Greek and Latin indices. So typically, um, I try to only ever use Greek indices when I'm talking about the coordinate basis. Um, and the Latin indices will often be an arbitrary basis, but sometimes, particularly if there are a lot of indices around, I might use Latin for the coordinate basis just for convenience, because, um, well, no, that's not true. I do know the Greek alphabet quite well, but somehow <laughs> it's sort of... <laughs> anyway, um, I don't know, I think maybe it's laziness, I'm not sure. But, but one thing that will be true is the Greek 
uh, label will always refer to a coordinate index. The Latin may or may not. So um, I, I think main, I'm, not, I'm not trying to pin that things down too much because I'd rather not get tied up with, you know, with having absolutely everything um, straight. But you know, there's things like uh, mu nu are usually coordinate indices in space times. So I j are often just spatial indices, but it should be clear from context. But if it isn't, just ask. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Right, so we've got vectors, we've got functions, we've got curves. So now we need to start building up um, a tensor algebra on our manifold. So we, first, thing, first things first, what we need to do is um, vectors are one sort of geometric object, uh, which we sometimes used to be called contravariant. We also want to sort of get a dual basis. So typically when we've got a basis, there's something called a dual basis. So let's sort of think about what this dual might mean. And a covector is a map from TP of M into the real. So it takes one of these vectors and maps it down into a number. And notationally, we sometimes write it in a variety of ways. So sometimes I use a bra and ket type of notation. Um, so this, this sort of, I guess, is taking you to this notion of Hilbert spaces. So one way of thinking about it. Uh, sometimes uh, if it's sort of fairly straightforward, it may just be omega of v. So that really is like a function of the vector. Um, and omega is in we write it at the dual basis as TP star of M. And this is the cotangent space. So for any uh, basis of TP of M, we've got a dual basis of this cotangent space. And it's defined by saying that the map uh, the map omega A is zero on all basis vectors except the one that's the same, has, carries the same index as omega. Question? Mm -hmm. Just to clarify, the index A here is just a label, right? It's a label, yeah. So, I mean, your, your um, EA, for example, <coughs> might be d by dx, so if, if a was 1, let's say an r cubed, e1 would be d by dx, e2 would be d by dy, e3 would be t, d by dz. So it is an index labeling the basis vectors. It's a set, it's, it's a finite set, we've got finite dimensional manifolds, and so it's just a label. Yeah, you've got to be careful here, because an index... When is an index not an index? So. so for the coordinate basis, we usually write, now can, how far down before this becomes invisible? I know there's always a problem with this corner. Say, stop, there. 
Right. So for the coordinate basis, we write dx mu, which you've you know, sort of seen quite a lot of, presumably, with the metric. Um, and then this would mean that dx mu d by dx nu uh, was delta mu nu, which is dx mu by dx nu. So this is uh, actually an example of <laughs> this d, although I've, I've written it as dx mu here, what we're going to see um, in the next lecture is that this d is, is actually something that has some geometrical significance. So here we're just using it to label the uh, coordinate basis, the cotangent space. <coughs> and I'm just sort of flagging it up as a sort of this will come back to haunt us type of thing. So we can therefore write our omega as uh, components in a coordinate basis. And then omega of v would be omega mu uh, v nu dx mu d by dx nu. So we write our covector and vector in their respective coordinate bases. This is then omega mu v nu delta mu nu, which is omega mu v mu. So that's your standard contraction of a vector with a covector. And then, as, uh, as David described, we construct tensors So we take the tensor products of Tp of m or Tp star of m, um, depending on what type of tensor we want to construct. So just to sort of wrap up this first introductory lecture, I just want to discuss a little bit about coordinate transformations. And sort of this will lead us naturally into thinking about differentiation. So we've really, or what I've tried to do um, is to emphasize the geometry of these, con these definitions, these constructions. We constructed vectors as tangents to curves. We've constructed covectors, well, I suppose it's not so much geometry, but mathematically, as maps from vectors to the reals. But of course, we want to know how to deal with these indices, so let's just look a little bit at uh, the, in a local coordinate chart. So this is sort of harking back to the way that um, vectors and covectors used to be defined. So a long time ago.
So our geometric object, it's invariant, so it shouldn't matter which chart we define it in. So I can write T in terms of my standard chart X mu, or I can write T in terms of my prime chart X mu prime. So if I look at what I just wrote down, which was just simply, you know, writing down the statement of the obvious, then this tells me that my components in the X basis are related to the components in the primed basis via just the matrix, just the coordinate transformation, so the, the way that X uh, depends on X primed. And so this is a contravariant transformation rule. And then for covectors, it kind of goes the other way. And this is covariant transformation uh, law. And so we can just check that uh, T mu omega mu, if I write this now down, I've got a T mu primed and omega nu primed. And I've probably gone and almost lost an index there, but not quite. So you can see that I can uh, simply, this, these co uh, coordinate transformation matrices just give me uh, dx primed nu prime by dx prime nu prime, which is, of course, delta uh, nu prime nu primed. And so my expression is invariant. And it should be because um, omega of t is supposed to be scalar and it shouldn't care what coordinate system it's defined in. So so far, pretty much everything we've seen has just been a very easy lifting up of standard vector calculus or vector calculus in, with possibly a Lorentzian signature in arbitrary numbers of dimensions, but it's so far things have been sort of just straightforwardly lifted up. But what I want to talk in 15 minutes about is we're going to move on and talk about uh, calculus on our manifold. And of course, this is where things start to get a little bit um, more complicated, start to unravel. Uh, and this really, this behavior under coordinate transformations is really where the problems start. <clears throat> so if we were, want to differentiate our vectors, and of course we do, because we want to do physics... Uh, then if we try and just do uh, a partial derivative, and go into our prime system,
sure Neil did this with you. What you see is you get a piece that's nice, a piece that looks like it should do for something that is both one index up and one index down. But for a general system, you also get uh, something that you don't want. So although in flat Rn, your x, y, z coordinates, uh, this matrix obviously vanishes. So you can always do partial differentiation. That's why vector calculus works. Um, for a general curve manifold, it's a different situation. So we'll be picking that thought up in a few minutes. And uh, I know you know about covariant differentiation. I'm not sure if you've done um, exterior differentiation or the lead derivative. So we'll kind of start with geometric definitions of a derivative. So we'll look at ways you can differentiate without needing a connection first.